was one of the most feared places on earth. A colony of the damned. The final judgment site for tens of thousands of criminals. It was so harsh, it broke the spirit of even the toughest convict. Here was a land of no escape, a hell on earth, a notorious prison colony known to the world as Devil's Island. On the northern coast of South America lies the colony of French Guiana. A quiet backwater, this small French outpost has been nearly forgotten by the rest of the world. Today, it's home to over 100,000 people who, thanks to massive subsidies, have the highest standard of living on the continent. But lurking behind the colorful exteriors, lies a dark past. Until the middle of the 20th century, this country existed mainly as a giant prison. Most people knew it as Devil's Island. From 1852 to 1947, men were sent here in chains. All were condemned to serve harsh sentences. Some faced the ultimate punishment. Over 70,000 convicts were eventually banished to the prison colony of French Guiana. It was really a living hell, especially when you realize that out of 70,000 men, three quarters died here from disease, from hunger, from mistreatment. And one can't deny that some men were sent to the prison camp even though they were innocent. And many of them were savagely beaten, tied to a bench and whipped. I hope that God reserves them a place in heaven. Devil's Island itself was the infamous home of France's most feared political prisoners. But what the world thought was just an island was actually a vast system of cruel prisons spread throughout French Guiana. The largest camp was on the mainland in the prison city of Saint Laurent. This was where the convicts first arrived and where the majority of them served their sentences. Many tried to escape. Some died at sea. Others perished in the savage jungle. Most were caught and less than 5,000 actually lived to see the day of their release. The once formidable prison is today an abandoned ruin. Its cells deserted. But some of its long-gone inmates have become legendary. Well, a short little video there about Davos Island, which, of course, is kind of infamous, and especially with the Second French Empire under uh, Napoleon III. So I welcome you back, of course, uh, History 1123. Uh, Daniel Simon of Baton Rouge Community College. We'll be having a great week out there overall. We had a great weekend uh, overall uh, as well. So uh, anyway, uh, of course, this week we'll be kind of shifting towards like the 19th century, at least major events uh, this week, probably in the next week uh, also as well. So uh, it's like we got a few students joining us right now, of course, uh, live. Uh, looks like we've got Samantha. Hey, what's going on uh, this morning? Trevor, uh, Shakina has also joined us as well. Mark, we're having a good morning. Uh, looks like Logan's also joined us. Rohan, um, Alex, hey, what's up? What's going on? Sophie, uh, also Julie, and also Jeannie's also joined us as well. Uh, in StreamYard right now, of course, we have Miracle and Grace anybody wants to join, of course, you can uh, live. You can, of course, join me in StreamYard also uh, as well. So uh, anyway, uh, this week, like I said, I'm going to be shifting like to 
I guess we call the post-Napoleon Europe period, like, you know, going into the 1800s. So I'll kind of talk a lot of things that happened, of course, during that time period, probably into next week a little bit. As we get up to World War I, we'll, of course, get into a lot of the cause of World War I, which a lot of those were in the 1800s uh, overall. So if you do have a comment, question during the live stream, of course, let me know. Of course, you can also uh, leave me comments later. Uh, you can also subscribe to my channel uh, as well. So here's the link to StreamYard.com. Uh, if you want to join me uh, as well. Uh, there's a bunch of assignments out. I did want to remind you before, of course, I get going today, uh, lecture-wise. Uh, but uh, I know we have like two main assignments that are out right now. Uh, the British Empire quiz is kind of wrapping up this week. I'll probably give you a couple more days on it. Uh, that needs to be wrapped up. And the, the one I just gave you the other day uh, on the Scientific Revolution Enlightenment, that'll be up for a while, but that one's that one I got still out right now, of course. I am giving you a new quiz today. It's a bonus type assignment uh, for you to do, uh, which is based off of the Devil's Island documentary I'll kind of give you to watch, uh, which kind of goes in more detail into that. But it's like a kind of a bonus assignment for that for extra credit. So try to do that, you know, because that's, that's extra points you can, of course, earn uh, toward the semester. It's like Michaela is also joining us. Uh, this morning in StreamYard as well. So uh, anyway, um, like I said, I'm going to, of course, move on to talk about the 19th century. I kind of need to go back to talk about France a little bit because uh, we didn't really get into uh, and talk about what happened after, you know, Napoleon was ousted. He was remember, sent into exile uh, to a couple islands and, of course, never came back uh, after 1815. Uh, and, of course, one of the big things that happened, you know, after you know, Napoleon, you know, was exiled, you know, twice, 1814 and 1815, uh, was that the Bourbons were restored, actually were restored twice, once in 1814. Uh, and then after Waterloo, uh, of course, the Bourbons were put back in uh, in 1815. Uh, they'll be in power till, you know, 1830. So we have, we have basically, because of the Congress of Vienna that we talked about in Asia Metternich, et cetera, uh, you get you get King Louis the Eighteenth back on the throne, uh, who reigns about ten years till eighteen twenty four uh, overall. And I kind of didn't really get into it, but the the um, actual uh, type of you know state that they create was a constitutional monarchy, which uh, was based off of an actual constitution uh, that they're kind of forced to adopt uh, because of the Congress of Vienna, uh, which is the Charter of eighteen fourteen as it was often called, uh, France had a lot of different constitutions uh, they've had in their past. And it, it, it did a bunch of things. Uh, one, I'll kind of give you, it, it actually created uh, a type of bicameral legislature, uh, which was sometimes nicknamed the chambers because it had these two chambers that were part of it, one called the deputies uh, and the other one called the peers. Uh, the deputies was for like mostly the common people or middle class. And then the peers uh, was mostly for the nobility. So the nobility were allowed to kind of come in uh, back into France uh, and gain more power uh, and all that. But the charter was important because it also guaranteed certain rights uh, for all Frenchmen that were, you know, based off of the French Revolution, I guess the Code Napoleon that Napoleon had been kind of working on uh, before. And so people had like a freedom of religion, uh, freedom of expression. Uh, they had property rights and so on. And of course, there's one thing that came in, uh, which was very interesting, was that they began to give men, you know, male suffrage, or we call the right to vote uh, at that point, which actually was based off of poll taxes. I think you had to pay a certain tax, basically, to be able to vote. Uh, depending on, I think, I think if you were in the assembly, you had to pay a good, a good number, like maybe a thousand francs. Uh, and then if you wanted to, like a Frenchman, be able to vote, you had to pay around 300 francs. So kind of like a poll tax, basically. Uh, there's one thing about the actual uh, Constitution, which is interesting. It gave the monarchy a lot of power, which is interesting. It's kind of like they were trying to revert back to the Bourbon period. But I told you how during the age of Metternich, they were trying to strengthen, you know, conservatism uh, throughout Europe. And so the king had a lot of powers that he had uh, that, you know, other constitutional monarchs didn't have, like in, say, in England, as an example. I'll kind of go through some examples of things he could do. The king 
the king like Louis the 18th, you know, who comes into power uh, at that time, you see his coronation, I guess, or being restored right there with that painting. But he had rights like he could um, uh, establish treaties. Uh, he could declare war. He could command uh, the military. Uh, he could appoint like justices, like judges, ministers. Uh, he could even issue ordinances uh, to the public and even uh, pass like laws, like he could draft laws and give it to the uh, actual chambers for them to decide on. Uh, and so he could legislate and things like that, which I guess monarchs could do before. Uh, so it's kind of in a sense like uh, they're almost trying to restore like the ancient regime uh, that they had before, but with obviously a constitutional monarchy. And I think the model was the British, uh, was kind of what they were trying to do uh, more or less. Now, uh, so yeah, we got. Well, I'll get to the Revolution of 1830, uh, which happens. But before that occurs, here's the actual king. So you got Louis the 18th. You see there, it's kind of overweight. Uh, he never had any children. Of course, Louis the 18th. And so what ended up happening, the throne then went to his actual younger brother. You see there, uh, which is Charles the 10th, uh, who. By the way, uh, was also known as the Count uh, de Artois uh, when he was, I guess, in exile, exile. Louis XVIII was in exile for a long time as well uh, when Napoleon was in power. And uh, Charles X is famous for being the last Bourbon monarch uh, of France. Uh, he, of course, only reigned about six years. Uh, and a lot of that was because of the fact that he was an ultra royalist. He really believed uh, that the monarch ought to have, you know, divine right powers. I think there's a famous comment where he once said that I would rather be a woodcutter than, than reign in the fashion of king, uh, the king of England, because the king of England was kind of a, you know, type of monarch that was, his powers were limited or whatever. Uh, and so he favored, he favored basically, you know, the monarch having you know, divine right. Uh, he wanted, he opposed like concessions towards like liberals, uh, even maybe limiting their, their rights and things like that that were guaranteed uh, the Charter of 1814. In fact, he hated the Charter of 1814. Uh, he actually wish he could think of get rid of it, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, but uh, Charles was known for some other things uh, when he was in power. I did want to mention about, you may have heard about, but Charles, Charles um, kind of get to it later, but yeah, the conquest of uh, Algeria kind of starts around that time, because uh, you get, you know, the French starting to kind of build another empire uh, throughout the world in the 19th century, especially with, with you know, you know about the French getting into Africa, like other powers like Britain, et cetera, overall. Primarily it was done to kind of distract citizens from various domestic problems that they were having in the country. And so in 1830, they think Charles initiated the first invasion of Algeria, uh, where they invaded Algiers, you know, which is the capital of Algeria uh, today uh, on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea of North Africa. Uh, Algeria is kind of situated between uh, Tunisia and Morocco uh, today. Uh, and it became very controversial later because of the fact that uh, they think the French, when they conquered Algeria, uh, committed a lot of um, genocide. Uh, and uh, it led to a lot of guerrilla warfare where the Al Algerian people's most of the Arabic type or Berber type peoples uh, fought against the French in a guerrilla campaign. But eventually, because of the French having, you know, better military, obviously better technology, or whatever, eventually overwhelmed them. And Algeria became a part of the you know, French Empire uh, at one point. But um, eventually he was overthrown uh, because of his, like I said, his radical policies uh, that he favored. In the country, and there's one thing that really they think that kind of, you know, eventually gets him overthrown, uh, if you know about it. In 1830, in July, he issues this thing called the July Ordinances uh, that come out uh, and ends up sparking a revolution, which is often called the July Revolution in France today. And uh, they were a series of decrees where uh, Charles wanted to prevent the spread of radicalism in the country. But he also, I think, was trying to kind of reestablish more absolute authority 
you know, of the monarch. In fact, he wanted to try and eliminate a lot of the press. He thought they had too many freedoms. He also wanted to dissolve the Chamber of Peers. Actually, I'm, not, I'm sorry, not the Chamber of Peers, the Chamber of Deputies is what it actually is. I think he wanted to get rid of, uh, which is the one for the middle class, not the peers. But he wanted to try to exclude the middle class from really having a lot of power uh, more than anything. And what eventually what happened was it, it, it angered the population. It actually did the opposite is what it, what it really did. Uh, and so it ends up uh, causing the people in, in France, like especially in Paris, to revolt uh, against, against his regime uh, and all that. And uh, it was later called the July Revolution, but a lot of the citizens uh, later end up calling it the so-called Three Glorious Days uh, when they overthrew him from July 26th to the 29th. And so Charles X was forced to go into exile. It's like considered like another French Revolution uh, in a sense. And the irony of it was they end up uh, going to exile in England. And he made that funny remark about that, but he ends up going to England, I think, exile after that, of course, because of it. So that's basically what happens to, of course, you know, uh, his regime getting overthrown. Hey, Elijah, what's going on uh, this morning uh, also uh, as well? So, yeah, that, that's a very famous painting, by the way. Eugene Delacroix, you may have seen that before, uh, which kind of depicts, you know, the people being involved uh, in that another revolution uh, right there. And it kind of depicts, like, not just, you know, men involved, but you can see women, children, even kind of getting involved. And I think it kind of romanticizes it, you know, whatever, uh, the revolt. But obviously it depicts not just, you know, uh, middle class, but I guess lower classes that also revolted uh, as well. So um, the next thing that happened, of course, after that, uh, oh, oh, uh, of course, you get this uh, new monarch that comes in uh, at that point, uh, which we'll, we'll, I'll talk about. I don't, I don't have a picture of him, but but because of the uh, February, uh, that's not the February, because of the um, because of the uh, liberty leading the people, you know, because of the revolution breaking out and all of that, they, they, of course, end up putting in uh, what is basically one of his cousins comes to power next, uh, which is um, Louis Philippe. He comes to power after that. And uh, he was like a, a cousin of the uh, Capetians, uh, which like right the Bourbons and all of that. Uh, in fact, he was a fifth cousin of Louis Philippe, uh, the uh, who was like the namesake of, of New Orleans, Louisiana, the Duke of Orleans, you may have heard of. Uh, and uh, the Capetians were like this um, minor branch. of the, uh, they're, they're basically the Capetians. They're like a minor branch of, of that particular uh, main dynasty that went back to the Middle Ages. Uh, and um, Philippe was called the July monarchy because he came into power July of 1830. Uh, citizen King, because he was elected in a national referendum uh, after that. Um, and some people called him the King of the French people. Uh, is another thing that he was also known by uh, as well. Uh, and um, but during his uh, during his administration, like when he was in power as king, uh, they have a lot of economic issues in the country that occur. And uh, one of the things that he does, it's kind of famous if you know about it, he actually brings back um, Napoleon, like his remains, uh, which, you know, Napoleon was buried on uh, St. Helena at one point uh, in the Atlantic. Uh, and so they eventually return him uh, in 1840, and they bury him in the uh, Les Invalides, Les Invalides in uh, Paris, which is this uh, collection of museums and monuments uh, which were de dedicated to various French heroes, like generals and I think Joan of Arc and others that are kind of buried there. Uh, and um, But his economy was kind of flagging uh, under Louis Philippe uh, and all that. Uh, and so... Uh, he was eventually overthrown uh, also as well. They have this so-called February Revolution that follows, like another another French Revolution uh, that breaks out under uh, Louis Philippe's administration. Uh, and um, because of economic conditions in, in, in Europe and also the fact that a lot of people wanted more political rights, especially the lower classes, 
radical groups and so on. You get like a series of revolutions that break out, uh, often called the revolutions of 1848. Uh, and But the one that's famous in France was called the February Revolution, which you can see took place over a few days, February 22nd to February 24th. And um, a lot of it was because people were kind of sick of the age of Metternich, uh, which was this period where they were trying to push a lot of conservatism you know, throughout Europe, which Clemens von Metternich had started at the you know, Congress of Vienna, 1814, 1815. And so a lot of the working class people, I think those are the main peoples that really wanted more rights and so on. They wanted like constitutional monarchies and things like that, or, or even they Republican ideas were put forth as well. And so um, a lot of them were repressed, but in France, they were kind of successful with, you know, actually, you know, making some reforms. And so because of because of that, because of the revolution of 1848, uh, what ends up happening is the French declare another republic. That's what they did, uh, so-called Second Republic. And they established another constitution uh, on top of that. Uh, I think France has like five republics at one point. They're in their fifth one right now. No, uh, but... This particular republic is kind of important, the one that the fifth one that they would establish uh, at that point, uh, because the fact that it would basically, what it would do, if you know about it, they would actually create a type of um, government where besides having, you know, a legislature like they had before, uh, they had a unicameral one called the National Assembly. The big thing it did was that it created the presidency of France, uh, which started in uh, 1848. And so uh, via direct universal suffrage, which it was one of the first constitutions to actually do that, uh, the president of France was elected uh, to a four-year term, uh, which at the time, uh, they weren't eligible for re-election. Uh, of course, today in France, a uh, president can be elected for a five-year term uh, is what it is. I think they can serve like two consecutive terms or something like that. And uh, the thing that's funny about the... Um, election of 1848, uh, they brought in a man who uh, you might be familiar with a little bit today, uh, who's known later as Napoleon III, but of course a lot of people call him another name, which is uh, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte. He was elected as the first president of France uh, in December of 1848. Uh, who was he? Uh, he was a nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte. Uh, Napoleon had this brother uh, named uh, Louis Louis Bonaparte, who at one point had been the king of Holland when um, Napoleon was controlling Europe, uh, etc. And so he he became popular because uh, at the time the uh, Bonapartists or people that supported the idea of Napoleon and his family being put back on the throne of France, they decided to put him on the throne uh, instead of like maybe a Bourbon or an Orleans type, you know, um, nobleman. Uh, and so uh, he came to power. But uh, if you know about Napoleon, uh, of course, the third, as they call him later, he got kind of aggravate, aggravated about the fact that he wanted to uh, have more power, uh, you know, over the state. Uh, and also he kind of had this idea to restore the uh, empire that his uncle had developed before, you know, the so-called First French Empire, Empire of Napoleon, uh, et cetera. And so what happened was in 1851, which happened to be on the anniversary, December 2nd, when Napoleon was crowned back in 1804, he basically did this so self-coup d'etat where he overthrew uh, the government. And uh, what he did, of course, if you know about this, was he came in and decided that he was going to restore uh, the French Empire. And so the French were kind of in support of it because they, they thought that that was when France was you know, a greater power. A lot of people thought that the Bonaparte should be back in power uh, as emperors. And so the Second French Empire was born uh, in 1852. Uh, it lasts about 18 years. Uh, as you know, uh, he would proclaim himself as Emperor Napoleon III uh, overall. Uh, the reason for that, of course, uh, was the fact that, um, you know, he had, he had Napoleon, his uncle, you know, was the first Napoleon, uh, the first. Uh, they do count Napoleon II, if you know about this, uh, who was the actual son of Napoleon. And so he's Napoleon III. 
So he kind of counted him, and then he's the third one, of course, in line. So they do have these so-called Bonapartists, they call them. These are like a type of political party that was real popular uh, in France uh, who support the idea of the Bonapartes, like the House of Bonaparte uh, being in power uh, as a monarch. Uh, and so I think there's still Bonapartists that are still around that still want to put them back in power because there's still some descendants, of course, of Napoleon that are still 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 alive today. Uh, now, I'll talk about the Second French Empire a little bit before I move on. So later, I'm going to talk about also the Russian Empire, which kind of is very conservative as well uh, after, after the age of Napoleon. Uh, the Second French Empire was very conservative. Uh, it was also a very authoritarian type state. It was kind of reigned with an iron fist uh, by Napoleon III. However, he was very famous for modernizing the French state not just internally, uh, but also rebuilding a lot of the cities, like the capital of Paris, if you know about, uh, was famous for being modernized uh, during that time. Uh, and um, Napoleon III at that time began to build more overseas colonies. That's one thing that the, the French are kind of known for uh, between the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, during that time, the French start, you know, like I said, expand into Algeria. They go into West Africa. Madagascar was also an area, of course, uh, they controlled as well. Southeast Asia, like where Vietnam is today, is another area that they'll kind of develop. And then also, of course, French Guiana, of course, which is in South America, which a little video, of course, I talked about. I'll kind of talk about it a little bit later about it. But that was also a part of the, the empire as well, uh, which really goes up to like World War I and after uh, for a while. Uh, in fact, the Second French Empire at one point was one of the largest empires in the world. Uh, it, I think, peaked at over 4 million square miles uh, with a population of 110 million. So most people don't think about that uh, much about it. Uh, but it, it was kind of relatively a large size empire uh, overall. So Napoleon was really trying to, you know, make France uh, into a world power, you know, like other powers like Britain, uh, et cetera. And so he wanted to construct, you know, a system of railroads throughout the country, uh, and industrialize the country uh, as well, uh, build canals, uh, modernize cities, uh, urban renewal. Those are the kind of things that he really did uh, to try to, you know, uh, make the French, you know, a major power and look up to, et cetera, uh, overall. Uh, there's one thing he was very famous for, like I said, uh, which, of course, which was the modernizing uh, of of Paris, which you can kind of see some pictures of that uh, right there. Uh, there's a very famous official named Baron George Hosman, if you know about this, who in the late 19th century carried out this huge, massive you know, urban renewal with the city of Paris. It was kind of controversial at the time, uh, as you know. He put in all these new boulevards, parks, public works uh, in general, uh, and um, they do think that a lot of this urban renewal influenced other, other cities later. You know, they often call Paris the city of lights, uh, which a lot of that's because later uh, Paris was known for having uh, the first lighted city, uh, not electrical light, but I think gas lights, that kind of thing. Later, I think arc lights, electrical lights, you know, later uh, that they have. And so later you get other cities that copy, like in Egypt, you got Cairo, of course, Buenos Aires in South America, of course, Brussels, you know, Rome, Vienna, Stockholm, Madrid, Barcelona, Berlin. Uh, they all go about, you know, trying to copy Paris, you know, modernizing, you know, the city uh, and all that. And the city itself was centered, you know, if you know about this, around where the Arc de Triumph is. You can see right here in that image, that's kind of the... You can see all the roads and boulevards kind of lead to that uh, and all that. And the Shamsili Way, of course, which is like, you know, running down here as well. Where, you know where the Tour de France usually ends and all that right there. You got the Eiffel Tower nearby. Uh, and so these are all these are all things that really help to advance, you know, Paris as a you know, major power uh, in the world. Uh, of course, another thing he did that that that, that they, the French did at that time is, you know, they started building the Suez Canal uh, as well. Uh, you know, the, the French and the British, I think, were kind of involved in 
trying to create this canal uh, in Egypt. Uh, and so in the 1860s, uh, that's when when majority of the Suez Canal was constructed. It was built by this uh, company called the Suez Canal Company, uh, and involved Ferdinand de Lesseps, uh, who uh, was a famous diplomat and the de de French developer. And I created this shortcut, if you know about this, between what is basically uh, the Mediterranean Sea uh, and the Red Sea, which is about, I think, about 100 and, I want to say 120 miles long is about the length of the actual Suez Canal right there. And it's very important. It's kind of like a silk road, if you want to say it that way, uh, between uh, what is, you know, Asia and Europe. Uh, I think a while back when they had that block, block, that blockage they had, you know, on the actual canal, that was kind of bad, uh, you know, because the main artery between east and west uh, that's going there. You can see most of the people that built it were Egyptian labor in the construction of it uh, overall. So it's very, very important. Uh, you can see it was opened in November of 1869 uh, as a whole. Later on, as you know, it was nationalized. I know in, the, in later on by the 1960s, you know, the uh, Egyptians took it over, you know, which was kind of controversial at the time, but heck, they were the ones that built it, you know, I guess in a sense, uh, you know, in the end. Uh, now, of course, the other thing that's very famous I did want to mention about as well, which, of course, is that Devil's Island, you know, uh, penal colony that they created uh, as well, uh, which Napoleon III helped to uh, develop, which you can see was founded in 1852. Uh, if you know about French Guiana, it was developed as a, a penal colony where they sent thousands of prisoners, people that were kind of rejects of, I guess, French society uh, criminals or whoever they didn't really want. And they sent there to the northern part of South America. Uh, and uh, the capital, of course, at Cayenne, they sometimes call it that too, because that's the actual capital city uh, of the city. Uh, and um, Davos Island actually consisted of the actual mainland. And it had these uh, three notorious islands that were off the coast, uh, where I guess some of the worst prisoners were sent there. I guess the ones that they couldn't, you know, rehabilitate uh, or whatever. Uh, and um, I think I've got images showing the, the different islands that were there. Uh, Devil's Island, Royal Island, St. Joseph Island uh, here. And um, I think that's one of the islands, kind of an image right there. But the prison itself was open for like close to 100 years uh, that people lived, lived there at one point. And uh, after you served your prison term, that's if you lived, by the way, <laughs> uh, you had to stay there. Uh, you, could, you couldn't move. Uh, of course, later they made movies out of it, you know, like Papillon with Steve McQueen and Dustin Hoffman. I think it's there's a new newer one that came out you know, a few years ago, which is not as good. Uh, that was made in the early 70s, uh, maybe 73, I think, when it came out. Uh, that's considered like, you know, I think one of... Um, Steve McQueen's top five movies, I think he was probably in overall. So it's very notorious, you know, the whole uh, French Guiana and all that. And it's still, like I said, it's still a colony. It's still, well, it's still like a part of the French, you know, state, the Republic now today, not a, not really a colony, I guess, anymore. All right. Um, now I'm going to move on to talk about a few other things about also uh, Emperor Napoleon III. Uh, also, another thing that's very famous about Napoleon III, which I think in the United States we might kind of know a little bit about this because uh, it happened during like around the American Civil War uh, and all that. But Maximilian uh, I, uh, who was like a cousin of Napoleon, who was actually a Habsburg, he actually put him in in Mexico as a ruler. Uh, this was part of the so-called French intervention of Mexico. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was dubbed. And uh, anyway, um, what happened was the uh, Mexicans weren't paying their debts. And so a bunch of countries like Britain, I think, came in, France, and some other countries wanted to intervene. And But France had this ulterior motive, which was to go in and take over the country uh, overall. And so from about, about 1861 to 1867, that's actually what happened, where the French invaded Mexico and tried to seize control of it. Uh, and uh, they became a client state of, of the French for a short time. Uh, but the Mexicans fought badly. They fought badly greatly in a, you know, guerrilla, guerrilla warfare, you know, under this Benito Juarez, who 
you know about it, was a famous president of Mexico. And uh, they were eventually successful. They actually defeated the, the French forces, and Maximilian himself was actually captured, and they later killed him. They, they later had him shot. Uh, and so um, that actually failed, you know, under Emperor Napoleon III. You can see all the land they kind of occupied uh, in that blue area in southern Mexico. But as you know, today, you know, in America, they kind of celebrate what they call Cinco de Mayo. Sometimes you may have heard about that, which is kind of based on that period, uh, which it's not Mexican Independence Day, which is actually September 16th. You wonder about that. Uh, but it celebrates the Battle of Puebla uh, in 1862. Uh, where the Mexicans defeated the French in a battle. And so it helped boost their morale uh, in the guerrilla war against, against the, the French. Uh, eventually, over time, they would, of course, defeat them uh, later. So I'll get to it later, but, you know, uh, we, we do have, like, Napoleon III does get the French Empire into the Crimean War. I'll talk about that in a little bit, uh, which happens in the 1850s. Uh, but that's that's another event that he's also involved in as well. So he's got his hands in a lot of things in Europe. You know, you think about the point of third, but in the end, he's kind of a failed ruler. I'll get to it later, but he, he later gets uh, defeated in the Franco-Prussian War. Now, we have the Russian Empire as well, uh, which uh, was also kind of going through a very conservative period after the Napoleonic Wars. This was all spurned on by Napoleon because he invaded, you know, Russia in 1812, uh, which, you know, angered the Russian people. Uh, and so under Alexander I, he was the emperor of Russia from 1801 to 1825, uh, Russia kind of became more conservative. Uh, they tried to squash any kind of radical ideas uh, in the country uh, at the time. And if you know about the Russians, like under the czars and I think later in the Soviet Union, uh, anybody that was against the regime uh, was sent into exile to what is Siberia, which is, you know, in the eastern part of Russia. Uh, in fact, the Russians had this secret police under the czars called the Okhrana, you may have heard of, uh, which spied on people internally in the country. Um, so if anybody was considered radical or whatever, they, they got rid of you and sent you east the Urals and all that. Later on, under, under Stalin and others, you know, rulers of Russia and the Soviet Union, uh, they had the Gulag, uh, which was kind of similar to it also as well. Uh, here's some images, of course, showing, of course, um, some of the different rulers that were part of the Russian state uh, that were here. So, yeah, there's like most of the 19th century czars, Alexander I, Nicholas I, Alexander II, Alexander III. And you have also Nicholas II that reigns until 1917 uh, as well. Now, um, I'm going to first talk about Alexander I a little bit, you know, about him. I'll kind of get into him because he's kind of famous uh, as a ruler of Russia. Probably might be the third most famous ruler that you have, of course, in Russia. Uh, he was a grandson of Catherine the Great. Uh, of course, he led Russia through a very turbulent period, you know, which was the Napoleonic Wars. And Tsar, the Tsar Alexander I, you know, was one, one of the main rulers that led the European coalitions uh, against Napoleon. He even led forces that came in, took Paris in 1814 uh, and all that. Uh, but like I said, he was a reactionary. He didn't really like all these, you know, radical liberal ideas that Napoleon was kind of circulate uh, throughout Europe and create kind of this alliance, especially with Clemens von Metternich and the Congress of Vienna uh, to try to squash any kind of radical ideas. So, but the only thing about Alexander, in 1825, he died without any heirs. I think he may have had like a couple daughters. They died young, so nobody could get the throne. And so it was going to have to go to his brothers, uh, which he had two brothers, one named Constantine uh, and the other one named Nicholas. Uh, Constantine was the oldest. Nicholas was the younger of the three, basically brothers. And, um, Kind of show the other ones that they had uh, as well. Chad, yeah, here you go. Yeah, uh, Constantine Pavlovich, who, by the way, kind of ruled over Poland uh, under Alexander. Uh, and then he had his younger brother, of course, which was Nicholas I uh, that they had. Now, what happened was he didn't want to become the czar afterwards. So 1825, he abdicated. Uh, they think there's different reasons for that. I know one was he preferred to be 
ruling over Poland as the governor of Poland, which Poles didn't like him, by the way. Uh, but he did have a Polish wife, which maybe that was kind of considered controversial or something like that. So he preferred to stay in Warsaw, basically. And so he gave the throne to his brother Nicholas, is what he did. However, uh, the abdication of Constantine caused a secession crisis in Russia. Uh, apparently, some of the military didn't like this and preferred Constantine as the ruler uh, over Nicholas. And so it sparked this so-called revolt that they called in Russia later the Decemberist Revolt uh, because it happened in December of 1825. It's kind of a major event. Uh, and um, anyway, uh, what happened was you have all these different military officers, you know, soldiers that, that really preferred uh, Constantine. I think the reason was that they thought Constantine would be more for reforms. Uh, and so uh, thousands of these men, like maybe about 3,000 or so, marched on St. Petersburg, demanding that they put Constantine in power uh, as the czar. And so in, because it was in December, they called him Decembrus uh, in Russia. Uh, and of course, you know, Nicholas had just come in as the czar in 1825. He'll reign 30 years till you know, 1855. And you kind of see that image up there at the top left, kind of showing the soldiers there. And what happened was it became a standoff between two sides. You had those that were the Decembrists, which were around 3,000. And then Nicholas was able to get about 9,000 troops that were loyal to him. Uh, and they, they, stood, they, they stood off in uh, what is now, they call it Senate Square now today, uh, but back then they called it Peter's Square, uh, named after Peter the Great uh, and all that. And uh, what happened was that Nicholas decided that he had to do something you know, about it. Uh, and so he used artillery uh, on the rebels, like fired artillery on them, and was able to basically break it up. Uh, and those that weren't killed or wounded uh, were arrested. So there's a bunch of ringleaders that were apparently part of it uh, and all that. But a lot of them were arrested. They were put on trial, those that survived. And, of course, what happened to a lot of them, if they, if they weren't executed, like I said, a lot of them were were later sent into exile, like I said, to Siberia. But uh, it's interesting about the whole December Revolt. They do think it's like one of the first of these revolutionary movements that you'll see later in Russia. You, know, you got the Revolution of 1905, Revolution of you know 1907, they have later. And so it's just the beginning of that uh, because Russia refuses to really make a lot of reforms. That was one of its big problems uh, that it basically had. Uh, but I will talk more about Nicholas a little bit. Uh, Nicholas uh, did begin to expand Russia. So under him, uh, they began to kind of, you know, try to colonize Siberia more uh, in the east. Uh, he also tried to, he tried to, you know, industrialize the country uh, as well, which mostly in Russia, the western part, you know, industrialized first, because that's where most people live, you know, in, in Russia, still do today uh, overall. Uh, another thing that's very famous uh, under him, uh, they began to build this road system uh, that was called the Great Siberian Route, uh, is what they called it. It was built, I think, in the 1800s mostly. And it was a system of roads that ran from like Moscow into the eastern part of Russia. And it also linked up into like Mongolia and China uh, as well. It's sometimes called the so called tea route because uh, a lot of tea came from China and other goods. Uh, overall, uh, and it later was important. The, the so-called Siberian route is kind of important because they'll later build that Trans-Siberian Railway that'll kind of run with it. And now it's like a highway system. I think it runs pretty much throughout Russia from west to east uh, that they have today. You know, like we have, like interstate systems that we have now uh, overall. Uh, of course, the big thing that happened under him that's that's well known is the Crimean War broke out uh, in 1853. Uh, and uh, this was a major conflict, which lasted around three years from 1853 to 56. It pitted really Russia and the Ottoman Empire at first, which the two sides have never really liked each other going back to early modern times. And then Britain and France came in as well, and they supported the Ottoman Empire, which a lot of that had to do with trade and so on, et cetera. And so it caused a lot of major conflicts, especially in the 
it caused a lot of conflicts in the Black Sea, the Balkans Peninsula, which is kind of west, west of the Black Sea. And the Russians, they wanted to take control of the northern part of the Balkans, uh, which you know the Ottoman Empire had controlled uh, for several centuries. But they had this dream, if you know about it, the Russians, where they wanted to take back Constantinople, which is what they called it, which is Istanbul today. They wanted to retake it because uh, they thought that was like, you know, one of the original capitals of Roman Empire. They also thought it was a Christian city originally, which they wanted back all that. And so that's that's often been a famous dream, you know, of, of Russia and still kind of is today, uh, maybe a little bit. Uh, showing some other images, of course, of the uh, Crimean War, uh, which is right here. Now, there are a lot of causes of it. I'll kind of get into it. Uh, the British and the French were kind of fearful that the Russian Empire, the Russian bear, you know, uh, would disrupt, you know, trade in the Black Sea. That's kind of an issue they thought would be a problem. But not just that. But, you know, the French and the British have these empires that are starting to develop in eastern part of Asia, China and all that. So they're kind of afraid that the Russians might disrupt that. You know, they built that. They're, they're working on that Siberian trade route, right, that's running east. As an example, so you got that problem. Uh, then there was another problem with religion. Uh, there was a conflict over the Christian churches in the Holy Land. Should uh, the churches there uh, be controlled by the Catholics, like which is more French, uh, or the Orthodox churches, which are more Russian? And that caused a lot of tensions, I know, uh, as well, because uh, in Russia they're mostly you know Orthodox and all that. And I think the Ottomans were more favoring the French, the Catholics, controlling a lot of the, the churches there. Uh, that are in, like in Israel and all that now today. Uh, another thing that's very famous about the Crimean War it was one of the first modernized wars. Um, you know, it had like, you know, use of railroads were built to kind of ship, you know, soldiers and industries to market. Uh, they started using telegraphs uh, in the early to, to mid uh, 19th century for telecommunications. So, or correspondents could send information back uh, to the public. Uh, also, people would know like what, what was going on battles, who was wounded, who was killed uh, pretty quick, quickly as well in the war. It's also one of the first photograph wars. So you're actually looking at that picture there of actual real soldiers in their uniforms with their weapons, uh, you know, at that time. There's a real picture, not a painting uh, that you're seeing. They still have paintings of the war and all that, but that's something you start to see like, paintings or see like really photographs of the battlefield and things like that. You also see that in the American Civil War as well. A lot of photo photographs of, of the battlefield, the, the dead and things like that that you see. Uh, also, a lot of their military, especially in the West, started to use new kinds of weapons like mass-produced rifles, uh, exploding artillery shells, sea mines are starting to be used. Uh, ships are armored with iron or steel, uh, long-range cannons, things like that. You know, the development of steel kind of coming along, being mass-produced uh, at the time. Uh, also, another thing that's real famous about the Crimean War, which you may have heard about, uh, modern nursing started as well. Uh, you may have heard of the uh, famed British nurse named Florence Nightingale. Uh, she, of course, gained fame for starting some of the first hospitals uh, to help with the wounded soldiers, not just in England, but, you know, at the actual, you know, you know where the battlefield's going on, all the wars going on in Crimea and all that. Uh, and so uh, that's something that starts to take off, of course, modern modern nursing. And as you know, she was later called the so-called Lady with the Lamp. It was her, one of her nicknames. So I think she started, like, in England, one of the first uh, schools for nurses uh, to educate nurses and things like that. Uh, as well. Uh, here's kind of a map showing the Korean War uh, right here. Uh, you can see the um, French-British forces and others brought up pretty much their forces through the Black Sea using naval forces uh, overall. And uh, the big thing that happened in the Crimean War, the most famous aspect of it, you know about this, uh, was that 1854, the coalition powers landed their forces on the Crimean Peninsula, which you can see is up there uh, in the northern part of the uh, Black Sea. It's right here. It's 
kind of looks like an island, but it's a peninsula sticking out here. That was a very important area. You have to understand that the Crimean Peninsula was like basically where the Russians' uh, Black Sea Fleet was, uh, which gave them a lot of control over the Black Sea, especially in the northern part of it. And they, that whole mission was to take it. But when they got there, it was difficult. And it became like a year-long siege uh, that dragged on uh, from 1854 to 55. And it was known as the Siege of Sevastopol, as they dub it, which is the main city and port that's there uh, on, on, the, on the Crimean Peninsula. It is kind of a classical siege, uh, by the way. Uh, and um, it is very famous for a lot of battles uh, that you may have heard about. There's, there's one, one battle, I think, that's considered one of the most famous that was fought there, uh, which was the Battle of Balaclava fought in October of 1854, which was actually mostly a British battle, I think involving like cavalry, where they were actually defeated by the Russians. Uh, but it became so immortalized by Alfred Lord Tennyson in a point you may have heard of called the Charge of the Light Brigade, uh, that it kind of became one of the most famous later uh, in, in the actual war. Uh, but the, the casualties were horrendous on both sides, uh, not just because of the war, but because of disease. And eventually the Russians gave up after about a year and they withdrew from the peninsula and they had to scuttle their actual Black Sea Fleet. They sank it and withdrew. Uh, and so uh, eventually, eventually uh, the war ended. They had, of course, a treaty that was founded called the Treaty of Paris of 1856. And Russia actually could not, for a while anyway, they couldn't have their forces, of course, on Crimea or naval forces on the Black Sea. Of course, now they do uh, as well today, but that's controversial. If you know about, about the whole Crimean Peninsula, as you know, a few years ago, uh, Vladimir Putin took it. Now it's you know controlled by the by the Russians today. Uh, but like most of the people that live there, Russia, you know, most Ukrainians don't live there because I think it was colonized by the Russians like a long time ago under uh, Catherine the Great. So some people think they should have it. It's kind of a debate about that, you know, about who should have it or not. But um. Crimean War is important. Uh, it marks kind of a turning point, you know, for the Russian Empire. Uh, a lot of people think that after this particular war, uh, the Russian Empire begins to kind of decline, uh, and they do have a lot of internal problems afterwards. Uh, they lose a lot of wars, uh, like they end up losing like one war against the Japanese. They lost, lost that war as well against the British, French, and the Turks. So all those kind of things, you know, are going to force the, the Russians to kind of maybe seek some reforms. But later, it's not enough. It's going to later lead to, of course, revolution is what's going to really happen. Let me move on for a few minutes. I did want to talk about uh, one czar who really was into actually reforms uh, in the country, even though he was assassinated in 1881, which is, of course, true about that. They do have this one czar uh, who does try to modernize the state of course, which is Alexander II. Uh, if you know about him, he was very famous for trying to make some internal improvements to the Russian state. He wanted to try to modernize it. And uh, the big thing that he's known for, which everybody's probably heard of before, uh, is the fact that he ended serfdom. He abolished it, uh, which happened in 1861. Uh, and so that was considered to be you know, kind of a turning point in, in Russia's history. Uh, with the so-called emancipation of the serfs. Uh, and of course, because of that, he got a nickname. He was later called the Alexander the Liberator or the so-called Tsar Liberator. And in a manifesto, uh, 1861, uh, all, all the serfs, uh, which I think were something like 23 million uh, that were throughout Russia, uh, were eventually uh, given their freedom. And I think at that point, they were gonna be given rights. They were given full rights as citizens, uh, they could even marry uh, without uh, the consent of like landowners or nobility uh, throughout Russia. They could even own their own property. Uh, they could even own their own businesses uh, and all that. And um, the only thing about that was that in Russia, a lot of them were impoverished. Like they, a lot of them didn't really have a lot of money to actually buy land uh, throughout Russia. And so Alexander had to come up with other reforms also as well to, you know, enable the people, you know, mostly peasants uh, throughout Russia to 
be able to, I guess, have some kind of farmland. And so the Russians came up with this actual system uh, that was called the Obshina, or, or they also call it the Mir, I think is another translation of it, of what it means. And um, this was the idea of communal living where uh, they developed like communal farmlands that were based off of peasant villages uh, that were throughout Russia. And so under the system, which was actually almost similar to like the open field system of like Britain, uh, basically families could get certain allotments of land uh, where they could work the land uh, primarily. Uh, and uh, it's kind of maybe similar to like the, you know, socialized farming that they have later throughout Russia, not quite like collectivization, uh, but they often call it like an agricultural commune. I think it's kind of what they call it later uh, overall. But later the Russians will keep trying to make reforms. They do have the Stoli pin reforms that are kind of made uh, in the early 1900s where they try to make farming more into like capitalist type farming uh, overall. Then the Bolsheviks or communists that take over Russia later with the Soviet Union uh, create more collectivization uh, where uh, the farmers are almost like wage earners, like working for the state uh, and all that. A lot of that was a failure, if you know about that, of course, later. Oh, one more thing about Alexander I did want to mention about that we may have heard about, of course, uh, in the United States. Of course, Alexander II is the one at the top right that you're looking there. Uh, he is famous for selling Alaska to the United States, which he did in 1867 uh, for about $7.2 million. Uh, this happened when Andrew Johnson was president during Reconstruction. Uh, and uh, in America, they called it Seward's Folly, uh, if you know, because of the fact that people thought it was kind of a joke because Alaska, you know, just known for what? Ice, icebergs, polar bears, whatever, seals. And so people didn't think that was worth buying. Uh, but Russia wanted to sell it. Uh, we ended up, of course, getting it. And, of course, later they discovered gold, oil, you know, things like that, of course, in Alaska, uh, which are now kind of important today. Uh, but he was actually assassinated. Uh, there was this group called the People's Will, which was kind of a radical group in Russia. Uh, they actually blew, blew him up with a bomb uh, in 1881. And so his son came in on the bottom right. You can see there named Alexander III. Uh, he was kind of this reactionary czar. Uh, who didn't really like all these reforms uh, that were kind of going on. And he was also a very staunch Orthodox Christian. Uh, he, he wanted to strengthen the Orthodox religion uh, throughout the country. He also didn't like Jews uh, living in Russia uh, as well. And so he helped spark a lot of uh, anti-Semitic movements against Jews that were called pogroms, which were kind of like these uh, anti-Jewish riots and attacks that, that, that occurred throughout Russia the late 19th uh, and early 20th century. Uh, and it caused a lot of Jews to leave the country. Uh, you know, like, I think like something like 2 million Jews eventually migrated from Russia uh, like to like the United States and I think United Kingdom. And I don't know if you've ever seen that movie called um, Failure on the Roof, I think it's called. They kind of show that where they're being forced to leave and stuff like that. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, he was kind of more, more kind of repressive with some of his policies. Uh, which Russia still need reforms, but they kind of stopped him uh, at that time. He was known as the peacemaker, which is true uh, because of the fact that Alexander uh, started making peace with foreign powers. The, the two main ones he did were Britain and France, uh, which are kind of instrumental later because, uh, you know, when World War I comes along, Russia, Britain, and France, you know, will ally against the central powers in Germany. Uh, and so, that had a lot to do with that because for a long time, France was kind of enemies with Russia, you know, going back to Napoleon III. That's something he kind of helped to do uh, overall. Now, industrialization was something he, he was better at, I think, more than anything uh, under him. Uh, he, he does, like under him, begin to build the Trans-Siberian Railway Network, which was started in 1891, uh, near, near the end of his reign, uh, and all that. Here's kind of a, the size of the Russian Empire, which you can see, you know, goes from Poland all the way uh, to the Pacific Ocean uh, right there. Uh, and uh, but they think that the uh, Trans-Serbian Railway was a railway network that was kind of, you know, following the same path that tra trans that 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 Siberian route 
uh, that we that that road system that we talked about before uh, that was there, uh, and uh, it was a way to link up, you know, Western Russia uh, with the Siberia, you know, far east, all the way to the Pacific. But you can see the actual railway system at one point uh, connected, you know, Western Europe later uh, with, of course, the rest of you know Eastern Europe and of course parts of Asia, and. Um, it is considered one of the longest railroad networks in the world. Uh, it's like around 6,000 miles. And you include the links that, that go down into like Mongolia, China, and also all the way down to North Korea. It's even longer than that. Uh, and you can actually still pretty much you know, ride the whole thing uh, from west to east uh, across, across it. And uh, it's, it's kind of important, too. You have to understand that the Trans-Siberian Railway was also important in increasing the migration of, of people like Russians into the eastern part as well. They say before World War One, around 10 million people actually helped populate it, the eastern part of Russia. As you know, the Soviets also sent people by railway as well to like the gulags and all that. So pretty much what they did if they survived the journey and all that. Now, there is one more czar I did want to talk about, which is true, uh, of course. Um, he was like the last one, of course. We'll, we, we'll kind of probably get more into him later, but you do have Nicholas II, of course, the so-called last czar of Russia, uh, as he's often nicknamed. You know, he kind of reigns between, you can see, 1894 to 1917. So he's kind of reigning between the late 19th uh, and early 20th century. Uh, he, of course, was the son of, Alexander III, when he came in, he was an autocrat, you know, of course, like his father was, I think even more. Uh, but they do think that under his reign, uh, that Russia began to decline. Uh, if you know about the Russians later, they, they get actually badly defeat, defeated in the Far East by the, by the Japanese, so-called Russo-Japanese War, 1904-1905. The Russians were trying to kind of control parts of the east, especially close to where Japan is, Korea, they actually suffered several major naval disasters where their Russian Navy was actually routed by the, by the Japanese Navy. Then later, of course, under his reign, they experienced a bunch of revolutions, the Russian Revolution of 1905. They, of course, have the famous one in 1917. Then on top of that, Russia is also defeated by the Central Powers in World War I, uh, and so all these things kind of help to cause, you know, the Russian Empire to decline. Uh, and later it's going to force Nicholas to basically get overthrown because the Russian Revolution in 1917, he's forced to abdicate uh, in February of that year. Uh, later in the revolution, uh, it goes into like a civil war, like 1918, I think up to like 21, 1921, 22. Uh, and you get the Bolsheviks, who are communists. They seize power of the country. They actually capture and take. They take you know Nicholas II uh, and his family hostage. They later murder him. They kill his whole family, uh, as you know. Uh, and that later leads into, of course, the Soviet Union. So that's kind of later a turbulent period, you know, uh, in Russian history. Of course, that's well known. Uh, but we'll we'll later get into talking more about Russia, what happens, especially around World War I uh, and all that. But uh, later in the week, uh, I'll, I'll kind of continue more about the 19th century. I'll kind of get into like the Industrial Revolution, the kind of peaks between the 18th and 19th centuries. I'll get into the rise of socialism. I uh, probably won't get to it, I think, this week. But later, I'm going to get into like the rise of nationalism, imperialism, which, you know, goes into like World War I. Because I'll kind of get into that because those are major causes, you know, of World War I uh, that we have. Uh, Carlette was also joining us late. Sorry I didn't see that. Uh, but I hope you all have a great uh, afternoon and, of course, the rest of the week, of course. Uh, but don't forget, I did put up a new assignment, that little video, of course, uh, for you to watch that documentary, a little bonus quiz for extra credit. So I'll send out reminders about that. But if you have any comments, questions, of course, about this lecture, you know, please let me know, of course, later. Look like we have any questions today uh, overall. But that's it. Uh, I'll see y'all later, of course, Wednesday. I'll send you some reminders out, of course, about the upcoming lecture. So y'all, y'all take care and all that. So see y'all, see you, see you later. Y'all take care.